small sailboats to go to sea right now in Sweden at the age of 82. But let's go back. Born 1939 on a small island in the North Sea, his father set to sea and never came home after the English sank his ship in Hong Kong. In school, after four years of a living hell of bullying and beatings by students and teachers, his mother discovered the reason was he was dyslexic. He was sent to a boarding school with staff more understanding of his condition, and he described it as a real paradise. Later, when he was conscripted into the army, his stubborn nature led him straight into trouble again. Resisting unfair treatment and punishment by superiors intending to humiliate him, things snowballed until eventually he found himself in a prison. In prison, things went much the same way, a terrible cycle, all the while Yervin feeling he was innocent and therefore unwilling to repent. He was moved to a maximum security prison. Finally, they gave up trying to break him and he was given a way out. Sign this paper saying you're a psychopath and you'll be given freedom and $25 to start a new life. Yervin signed. The paper was meaningless to him because he had no interest in achieving some bourgeois career. He said, I chose to be captain of my own ship. The mass of men has historically traded freedom for economical growth and comfort. I do not agree. True, our comfort has increased beyond imagination, but so has our enchainment. In 1962, at 23 years old, he left for sea the first time in a 4.75 meter or 15 foot boat called Blekengeken. It was a rowboat he put a wood deck on and a crude wooden box for a cabin. Not very seaworthy, but good enough to to be a floating home and take him from safe harbor to safe harbor in good weather. He had very little money, so freedom on a small boat was the obvious solution. So perhaps by accident this time, he learned the great advantages of a small boat. He wrote, to be attractive, according to the established doctrine, a yacht must be comfortable. That is also wrong. Comfort breeds boredom and it makes you lazy and fat. Consequently, it does not fulfill its purpose. It is just a pain that costs money and takes up your time. That same year, he went to Japan and stayed with fishermen on an oyster farm for a month to learn the skill of the yulo, a kind of superior sculling oar. The story is very interesting, and I'll leave the link below uh, if you want to read more. He still uses these techniques on his boats. 1967. Despite the ex-convict psychopath label, Yervin got a job as a mathematics teacher and as a result, earned some money. In the 13 foot long Anna, a rowboat he converted to a cruiser, he cruised Sweden and made plans to sail around the world in this boat. May 1968, he sails for England. There, out of money and pressured by sailors who felt his boat was too small, he sold it. He tries out refitting a 12 meter, 40 foot, a 12 meter or 40 foot iron wreck sailing it across the Atlantic, but eventually selling it, deciding that a bigger boat, while faster, did not make him more happy. Big boats, big problems. Small boats, small problems. In 1971, back in Sweden, he began to build his next boat, named a Bris, in his mother's cramped basement. He sailed from Sweden in 73, over Scotland to Madeira, down to Rio and Argentina. But after being capsized and pitch -poled, he sailed east to Tristan da Cunha, where he stayed for four months. Then on to St. Helena, Martinique, Newport, Rhode Island, and across to the Azores, and finally Sweden. 1976, he started to build a six meter or 19 foot aluminum boat with a roomy aft cabin, also called Bris. Two years later, it was done, and he put to sea with an Italian girl. They sailed to Brazil, where the girl left to continue her studies, and Yervin continued on to Argentina in 1980. This is when he became the first Swede to round Cape Horn single-handed. He did it east to west against the prevailing wind and currents in a 19-foot boat. Not only that, but it was June, the southern hemisphere's winter. 
He navigated by a sextant and dead reckoning only. He would have done it in warmer weather, but surgery for a hernia delayed him, and waiting for the next season was not an attractive option. The Royal Cruising Club England awarded him the Medal of Seamanship for this, a distinguished award which had been given to sailing greats like Sir Francis Chichester, Bernard Montessier, and Sir Robin Knox Johnston. Yervin went home to Sweden to build the new, smaller sailboat he was dreaming of. Cyclebris was built 1985, then Amphibibris 1989, which he crossed the Atlantic in. Yervindarin in 2005, a boat called Yervin.com in 2011, and Yervin 10 2015. In 2020, on his latest boat, Exlex, which means outside the law, or basically outlaw, he sailed from Norway west over the UK and down south to Madeira and the Azores. At the time of filming this, August 2021, he just returned to Sweden after a 26-day after 26 days sail from the Azores to Ireland. The amazing thing about his track is how straight it is. He uses no wind vane to self-steer the boat. He just builds them to be self-balancing. To compare, I watched another sailor make the trip at the same time in a 28-foot boat with a wind vane, and this was his track. He built the boat himself in his workshop of four centimeter or 1.5 inch thick divinacell and fiberglass. Divinacell is a semi-rigid foam core that's a great insulator and it's a closed cell foam so it provides excellent flotation. Xlex measures 5.8 meters or 19 feet by 1.2 meters or 4 feet. At sea he uses a liter of water a day and eats one meal a day, the same meal. It's called a muesli, which is essentially a kind of oatmeal with dried fruits in it that he mixes up himself and vacuum seals. Why small boats are safer than big boats on the open ocean. Even if you put to sea in a 30-foot boat, some fellow boaters will laugh at you. Family will express real concern and beg you not to depart. All of them will stress that you need a bigger boat. Every boating-related vendor, service, fuel dock, marina, boat yard, and boat broker stands to realize a greater profit if they can make everyone believe this. Through decades of work, they've been successful. When the first Nordic folk boat was launched April 23, 1942 in Gothenburg, at 25 feet long, it was considered too big. In addition, it was criticized for its high freeboard. Now, if you're on a 40-foot sailboat, that's considered the size you start with if you're to be taken seriously. A 30-foot sailboat is called small. Heck, someone <clears throat> actually had the nerve to call one a micro yacht. I wouldn't call a boat mini until it's 18 feet and micro maybe once it's 14 feet and under, but there's no written rules, so I guess it's up for interpretation. Now at the top of Yervin's website, there's a link titled Manifesto. When I clicked, I discovered that hidden in plain sight here was an excellent 95 page free ebook. I highly re recommend giving it a read. I want to sum up my 10 favorite points he makes about why you should choose a small boat to put to sea in. Number one, more damage is caused when a large boat runs aground or hits a floating object like a tree trunk. Kinetic energy increases with the weight of the boat multiplied by its speed squared. So a 10 ton, 40 foot boat hitting a reef at five knots has a driving force 15 times as destructive as a one-ton boat hitting it at four knots. It's not economical or practical to design a large boat strong enough to handle these forces, so they don't. Number two, large production boats are not required to have positive stability up to 180 degrees. Many only design them to 120 degrees. So if they turn upside down, they'll stay that way comfortably. A small boat can be easily built to recover to upright from an upside down position and you're much more likely to still have your mast attached because the decreased length and weight of the mast and area of the sails will not exert such terrific force on the mast or rigging. 
No production boat builder will design a mast to withstand the forces it will encounter in a rollover. It's too heavy and too expensive. Number three, big boats need big engines. Go to any bay and you'll see large sailboats motoring around on large diesel engines. Fuel expenses are cheaper than large sails. Large sails are heavy and a bother to uncover, raise, lower, recover. In times of light wind or tight spaces, when you stand to learn the most about seamanship and sailing, the sails are down and the engine is on. The captain becomes less and less confident in his sailing ability and sails less and less. He might even remove his mast and fiberglass over the hole. You can see these kind of boats on the intercoastal waterway on the east coast. On a beautiful sunny day here in San Diego Bay, I see thousands of lovely sailboats tied up to docks and mooring balls, just unused status symbols. Motoring around on a sailboat is boring, unchallenging, and it makes people lazy and unskilled at sailing. Number four, the larger your boat, the more time you'll spend in port repairing things and waiting on parts. The smaller your boat and the simpler its systems, the less problems you'll have. Even the richest boat owner will be stuck in some foreign port waiting for parts. Number five, if you want a boat 26% longer, the cost will double. Your time on maintenance will double. Cost of parts increases exponentially. Your annoyance and anger will grow proportionately. Big boats are complicated, waste more resources, waste more money. They have to endure greater forces so they're less safe. It requires too much money to give them strong enough rigging or watertight compartments or a strong enough hull in relation to their weight, so the builders simply don't. Your worries and stresses increase, so your happiness decreases. All right, number six. Bureaucracy has ruined sailboat design. Colin Archer was designing seaworthy boats already 100 years before all the silly rules that came about and were applied to production sailboats to supposedly make them better for crossing oceans. Rules came about for reasons such as creating trade barriers or to make boats compete more equally in a race. Boat designers found loopholes to the rules, ending up with faster boat than the competitors, but at the expense of being poorly designed. Safety was not a high consideration. If you don't care about racing, you can ignore these and build something watertight, strong, <clears throat> and small that's self-riding through 180 degrees. Number seven, small is strong. It's well known that some ants can lift 50 times their weight but an elephant can only lift one-tenth of its weight. 460 years ago, Galileo showed that when an object undergoes a proportional increase in size, its new surface area is proportional to the square of the multiplier, and its new volume is proportional to the cube of the multiplier. Now that's a mouthful, but the important part is it's called the squared cube law, and basically the stresses grow much faster than the strength. Double the size gives you half the strength. Three times the size gives you a third the strength, and so on. Small animals like cats and mice can be dropped from a second story window and scamper away. Not so for the unfortunate cow or horse. In 1901, Annie Edson Taylor became the first to survive the 174 foot drop over the Niagara Falls in a four and a half foot wooden barrel. How do you think she would have fared in a 25-foot wooden boat or even a 25-foot wooden barrel? The forces of impact would shatter such a craft. Number eight. A small thing at sea floats free and is, and is unbreakable because they can give way to powerful waves instead of resisting them. It's why a wine bottle with a cork in it can float around the world unbroken. You can easily crack a strong nut with a hammer against a table, but hold it in your fingers up in the air and strike it with as big a hammer as you like. It won't break. It's free to move with the blow. As for boats in large waves, the boat's own weight is its resistance. When the boat's mass is accelerated by rough water, 
a counterforce arises. A free-floating small boat can't be hit hard by a wave because it moves with the force. Number nine, December 6th, 1982, another one of my sailing heroes, Bernard Montessier, sat at anchor in Cabo, Mexico, when a storm hit and sent many boats onto the shore. Around 20 of them were completely destroyed. Bernard's Joshua, a 40-foot steel catch, was driven hard ashore and filled with sand. The masts had broken off. He sold his boat to two young men for less than $100 and walked away. Had the boats been small with strong flat bottoms, the crews would have been able to haul them up on the beach before the storm and save them with the help of simple techniques. There are more examples of sailors who ended up on reefs and were unable to move their boats back to deep water due to their weight. A lighter boat with a strong bottom could be moved back to deep water using simple techniques. Watch the excellent documentary Following Seas on Amazon to see renowned long distance sailors Bob and Nancy Griffiths experience losing their 50 foot cutter on a reef. Number 10, a smaller boat has to push less water out of the way as she sails. She requires less sail area than a larger boat to reach her cruising speed. With a smaller sail area, with a smaller sail area you can shorten the mast. A mast of half length is four times as strong just like a short stick is harder to break over your knee than a long one. Thanks to it being stronger, it can be made thinner. With less stress on the mast, it can be constructed in a substantially easier and cheaper way. It can even be raised or lowered by hand and won't need standing rigging to hold it in place. You've now lowered the boat's center of gravity and healing moment. This in turn means the boat can do without a heavy, deep ballast keel. Without that, she's lighter and requires less sail to move quickly. From these points, I feel it's obvious that as you decrease the size of the boat, you get this upward spiral of benefits where you save energy, the environment, money, hassle, and frustration. And at the same time, the strength and safety of the boat is increased. Time spent sailing instead of maintaining systems increases. Um, if you're interested in Mr. Yervin, please check out his website. Um, you can read that free ebook. And if you like it, consider um, making a donation to help him finish the boat he's working on right now. Thank you. Mr. Bordell, let's make all preparations for getting on the way. That guy sure likes to carry things. Hey, uh, what's your name, buddy? Oh. How do we get back to your station? I'll have you shot for a mutineer. Well, shoot something. <laughs>